Greetings and salutations, young true believers. All right, so today we're going to talk about something I wrote my dissertation on, and that's the question of the limit and scope and possibility of scientific objectivity, right? Just the human, the human capacity for objectivity, right? So this is what Robottom is talking about in his article, Science Does Not Discover the Truth About Reality, on page 170 of our text. Um, there's a view that's been variously known as the God's eye view, the God trick. And it's the view that human beings can know the ultimate truth about reality, right? That's what science is in the business of doing is, is describing reality as it is in and of itself, right? In other words, independent of anyone's viewpoint, this is what reality is. And Robotum asks, well, is that really what scientists are doing, right? And he talks about the parable of the alien artifact, right? This alien artifact is discovered, right? Um, we know it's an alien artifact. It was dropped off some extraterrestrial ship. It has lights on it, right? We can't cut it open. We can't look inside of it. Some scientists make the supposition that it's a clock. Others argue it might be some kind of like barometric device or... Uh, Maybe, you know, it's it's meant to, to, to analyze, you know, weather patterns. You know, we don't know what it does. We can't cut it open, right? And so in an attempt to gain better understanding, a couple of scientists make various models. They make duplicates of it, right? And one scientist, hers, is extremely complex. Another's is very simple. One runs on solar power. One's, one runs on battery, Right. Um, but we're still just speculating at this point on what's inside of it, right? And then one day somebody invents um, a new kind of machine that's analogous to an x-ray that allows us to look inside the, the, the alien machine, right? And what do we see? We see shapes, right? We see gray and black areas, right? Um, some areas are more visible, other areas not, right? Um, This this is a very difficult situation for the scientists right now. So it's often, you know, to, to give you an idea of, of the kind of situation the scientist is in, right? Especially the physicist and the, physicist and the biologist. Imagine that, you know, something like this actually happened. And, you know, some kind of artifact fell off an extraterrestrial craft, right? To use, a, to, to really put this in perspective for you, right? Imagine that you were driving along in your car and somehow you got instantly transported back 200,000 years ago. You're driving along the you know, savannah of East Africa where we all came from, right? And a piece falls off your car. Let's say um, the muffler falls off your car, right? And then you're whisked back here. The ancient humans, right, that lived 200,000 years ago are left to you know, try to figure out what is this thing? What does it do, Right? We saw it on that weird machine, right, that that person was driving. Whatever, you know, they don't know what the hell driving is, but they were in this machine, right? But we don't know what this thing is, right? So they begin to speculate. They don't, you know, they don't have any experience with steel, right? Steel hasn't been invented. Steel is, a, is an ore that's made by um, tempering iron with carbon, right? They don't have that. They just have iron, right? So the material is strange. They don't know what function this thing could possibly perform, right? And then we're in the same situation with you know, respect to the natural world. We look at the natural world and we look for regularities, right? But here's the problem. We're finite humans, meaning we have a finite intellect. We have finite sensory apparatus, right? Now we can augment our sensory apparatus by means of telescopes and microscopes, right? They enhance it, but they don't replace it, right? They don't replace the senses we have. They simply enhance them, right? Um, we are influenced by biases, unconscious biases that we might have, biases that we're not aware of until they're brought to the fore. For, for, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When Richard Leakey and his team were in Ethiopia in 1975 and they discovered the Lucy skeleton, Lucy the Australopithecus, right? 
the story goes that they named the skeleton Lucy because they were they had a little record player and they were listening to Beatles White Album and Lucy in the Sky when Diamonds came on when they discovered the, the skeleton. And Leakey reveals, no, that's not why we named the skeleton Lucy though. He later revealed in his autobiography, I think 10, 20 years later, the mm-hmm. real reason we named the skeleton Lucy is because it was small. And small, diminutive, right, must mean female. But that's that's a bias, gang, because we, now we know that Australopithecus was a small species. They weren't any bigger than a chimpanzee, right? So that's just a one very simple example of the kind of biases that we bring, right? And we're creatures of our time. We're creatures of the early 21st century. Um, humans that live a thousand years from now will have different biases, perhaps, and they'll have different... They'll bring different expectations, right, to bear on their observance, right? Um, That's not to say that we don't discover things. We absolutely discover things, right? Um, But I think that Robottom really sums this up nicely. This is page uh, 179 of the text, right? As I've already mentioned, I pretty much agree with Clara. Clara is one of his hypothetical scientists that's working on the alien device, right? I would summarize this as follows. The main way we have to work out what's in the world is experience. And experience tells us about observable things insofar as it tells us about things that we observe. It doesn't tell us about unobservable things. On the contrary, there are many different theories about unobservable things that are consistent with what we experience. That is the observable facts. We shouldn't rely on principles that don't derive support from our experience, like the simpler theory is more likely to be true, everything else being equal. He's talking about Occam's razor, right? Or the theory that gives the best explanation is most likely to be true, everything else being equal. He notes, even if we were somehow to be shown that these exceptionally dubious principles were correct, there would still be a significant barrier to using them. Why? Because we don't seem to have any grounds from experience or otherwise for thinking we've conceived of the simplest theory. We might think something is the simplest theory, but how do we know that, right? There may be yet a simpler theory that can be constructed, right? With fewer moving parts, so to speak, right? To put it bluntly, he concludes, we are highly limited creatures. We have limited senses, limited intellects. We are constrained by our our historical uh, historical cultural circumstances, right? think we could discover fundamental things about a reality that lies beyond our limited senses would be to think that our intellects are except, exceptionally powerful and perhaps that we have some faculty insight by which we can eliminate some logical possibilities. Humility is more appropriate. We are men and women, not gods. Thus, in brief, right, I don't think science typically discovers the truth about reality, but it doesn't mean that I don't value science. On the contrary, I value it as highly as a means by which to solve practical problems. That's my view. And this next, these next few sentences really nicely sum up the, what I argued in my dissertation. I value theories that talk about unobservable things, especially theories that are simple, that have high explanatory power and so forth. I just think that these virtues are pragmatic in character. They make the theories easy to use, and using them is the, is the operative concern here, right? How can we apply these to the amelioration of problems, right? They're easy to memorize. They furnish us with a subjective sense of understanding of the empirical world and so forth, right? Are we really describing the world as it is, or do we have a useful approximation of reality? Well, for myself and for Mr. Robottom, we have a useful approximation of reality.